So I don't think I need the mic. Is that going to work for everybody? Um, I actually dropped out of clown college, so don't expect too much humor. It's just I didn't I, I, I didn't it was a clown college dropout. I'm sorry. So thanks for coming and thanks Greg for inviting. Um, I actually grew up in um, Western Mass, so it's really nice to be back. I reside in California, um, but it's lovely to be back in New England in the autumn. So I had requested a couple of volunteers to read a few quotes, but we need to use the microphone for that. Yeah, this is from Gandhi from 1940. So when Gandhi was assassinated, he was busy forming a Shanti Sena, which is Sanskrit for peace army and it was really designed to take um, that commitment of nonviolence and bring it to conflict areas where violence and human rights abuses were happening. And so the organization that I'm primarily connected with, Nonviolent Peace Force, is trying to take this idea of a Shanti Sena, of a peace army, and make it a reality. And um, as we've seen with Martin Luther King, with the Arab Spring, that the power of nonviolence is, is incredible and when used well, it can overturn dictators. So what I'm going to do with our time together um, is talk a little bit about how I came to this work. Um, a short segment of a film on the Nonviolent Peace Force in Sri Lanka where I lived for several years. Um, this film was made during the Civil War, which ended in 2009, so it's um, during, during the conflict. Um, and talk about Unarmed Civilian Peacekeeping, or UCP. And then different organizations that work together to build this movement. And a little bit about a relatively new concept that came out of the UN, R2P, Responsibility to Protect. And then what you can do. So my primary goal is to spark your imagination on how we can respond to violent situations whether it's in Syria, whether it's in the classroom next door, whether it's in your home, whether it's between countries, what can we do that's more creative than simply using more power, more weapons? There are always options. As Greg mentioned, I worked for some years in domestic violence. Um, and many of the issues with men who acted out with violence in their home were similar to some of the issues around groups that act with violence towards other people. And it's a sort of a, Adrian Rich talked about how violence is a failure of the imagination. And so what I want to do is inspire your imagination when you think about alternatives to violence. So um, I grew up with a family of seven kids in uh, Western Mass. And um, that was me in the peace pipe smoking when I was maybe nine years old. And uh, that was sort of the beginning, was being the peacemaker in a family with seven siblings of two families that came together. And big families often have plenty of conflict. So that was a, a part of my own genesis. The other part that wasn't so pretty and wasn't so fun was um, at one point in my own family there was violence that involved a weapon. And the police were called when I was quite young. And even as a small child, there was an awareness that simply having somebody come in with, with more power with guns was not the answer. That there was a better way to transform the chaos and the fear and the anger and dysfunction of my family than simply bringing in the police. So that was really a part of that. And, um, and ultimately my father took his own life when I was 10. And, and that same sort of thing that there was some awareness that if we could transform that suffering, that um, there's a better way than violence either inflicted on yourself or inflicted towards other people. So if I can make the technology work, I want to share just that short film on the work we did in Sri Lanka.
And if you do have questions, save them up because we'll do have some time for questions and discussion at the end. The Nonviolent Peace Force is the gift our grandchildren are asking of us. La Fuerza Internacional de Paz es una herramienta de reflexión y acción. The way of making human solidarity a reality. It can really make a difference in our world. The better way for the 21st, 22nd, 23rd ad infinitum century. The best practical vision we have for resolving conflict in our world today. The Nonviolent Peace Force is essential. The reality of the dream you've always known. One of the greatest hopes for my generation. The global movement of the civil society and of the people for peace and justice. A gift to my children and my grandchildren. Una forma práctica de trabajar todos juntos en el mundo por la paz. Something whose time has come. A century ago, 90% of the casualties of war were combatants, were military men. Today, 75% of the casualties of war are civilians. And so as civilians, as people to people, it's time for us to step forward and to protect each other. Gandhi was working on the Shanti Sena, the peace army, when he was assassinated. And what's happened over the last half a century is that the vision has occurred and recurred enough that it's entered into our consciousness. There's a strong resonance cross-culturally when we talk about this approach to conflict transformation. Once you see something, you just can't close your eyes. My sense is that 95% of the people in the world do not want war. They do not like killing. And they don't like that the only alternative is to do nothing and allow ethnic cleansing or any other kind of violence to happen. And they're not satisfied with the alternative, well, we'll just go in and kill people. It's our hope that if we can show through our example that there is a viable alternative that works and costs one thousandth or maybe a millionth what armed intervention would. We see wars like in Bosnia, Croatia, where good people who oppose war say that there's no alternative to NATO bombing or something else that's violent because there hasn't been a credible enough option for that. Nonviolent Peace Force is the opportunity to make that option visible, credible, powerful enough that people say, what I would do is send in third-party nonviolent intervention. What I would do is send in the Peace Force. What we are organizing is the world's first trained, standing, civilian nonviolent Peace Force. What that means is we will have a group of well-trained civilians who are trained in effective nonviolent strategies. And then they will go to areas of violent conflict at the invitation of one or more local groups from that area. While there, their mission will be rather narrow. It will be to protect human rights, to protect human life, and to help create the space for local people to do reconciliation work and stay alive in the process. We have this project in Sri Lanka, a single year of which costs about what the U.S. Department of Defense spends every two minutes. I've had an opportunity to travel in Sri Lanka in the north and the eastern parts as well as in the southern parts. I understood that when common people talk about the need for peace, how after 20 years of war, and I could feel what's the significance of peace and nonviolence. Jaffna was the cultural center of the Tamil people in Sri Lanka. You can feel that, that there is a lot of culture on the other hand, it's really devastated by the war. This was a battlefield. Most houses have been demolished. You can see bullet holes in almost every building. There is a very, very high number of military in the town. There are areas where really at every corner there is military around. The situation is 
not good at all for human living standard because you'll find that uh, close to 50 families are sharing one water point, one well. The same 50 families are sharing one toilet. Then the people for, for sure who, who wants to go back to their houses, who are internally displaced people, who live in, under very poor conditions, who just want to go home. What we perceive as the main uh, conflict area is the culture of silence. Society prefer to suffer in silence amidst all the atrocities. What we do is like making a loudspeaker for this silence. If violence in countries are silent, if we don't know about them, that's bad. But it's worse when we don't know about the nonviolent struggle that allows civil societies all over the world not only to know that there's a conflict, but to know that there's hope. You can't parachute people into conflict areas with rucksacks full of good intentions and expect peace to break out. And so what we're talking about are people who are well-trained, who are disciplined, who are committed to a common mission and a common decision-making structure, and who will be carrying out tested nonviolent strategies in an effective way. I think the strength of NEP is that we are really working on the grassroots level, that we really try to work with the people, that we have the time and the capacity to really build relationship with people. Getting to know people, to build relationship, to build friendship is something that is not easy. One of the nice things about the Peace Force is that we're pretty low to the ground, and that really seems to inspire a fair degree of trust. If you are asking people to be peaceful, then we ourselves must be peace-loving people in ourselves. You know, it should come from our, you know, our within. My work site in Sri Lanka is in a place called Mutur. It's one of the oldest Muslim communities been here for the last six or seven hundred years. It's one of the most conflicted sites since the ceasefire. More people have been killed in Mutur than anywhere else in the country. When we first came to Mutur, it was a completely different scenario, a completely different reality. We got here the first time in October, so it was just a couple of months after very violent phase between the communities, the Tamil and the Muslim community. We had people going to sleep in the church because they were afraid of sleeping in their houses. I can feel people more relaxed. They are more open to us. And uh, we feel that they accept our presence, having us as neighbors, having us as part of the community. We go to the market with them, we buy the same vegetables, the same fruits, we talk to them, we invite everybody to the house to come and have tea with us, and they come. Our presence as foreign internationals is a deterrent for violence in the community. And so one of the ways that Soraya, my teammate and I, make ourselves present is by taking a peace walk walking around the community and we talk and we chat with the people as much as we can. They don't talk much ab about the future because they are so afraid that violence is going to come, war is going to come back. They feel it's out of their hands. The idea is to make Mutur an example for peace for the island. It's a big dream, but it's, you know, this is what they are working for. Most of the, the agencies that work in this area, they evacuate their people. But we stay because we are here because of the conflict. We are here to prevent, to observe and help reduce violence in the civilian community. When a battle broke out between two factions of the Tamil Tigers, our team, working with local religious leaders, went into the villages and through protective presence, prevented the violence from spilling over into the civilian population. In Sri Lanka, there is a rampant use of children as soldiers. Children are abducted as early as age eight. The median age for casualties for the Tamil Tigers is 16. Our teams also play an important role in helping to reunite child soldiers with their families and then provide a protective presence to prevent reabduction. During the recent elections, our teams provided critical accompaniment, monitoring, and presence, so as to deter violence at the polling place. There's these conflicts going on around the world, most of which we don't even hear about because they don't have strategic relevance for the United States. So often in the United States we contribute to, to the conflicts, 
um, either through weapon sales or through various strategic interests that we might have. And it means a lot to me to feel the support of other people in the United States to be engendering a culture of peace. We have hundreds of endorsers, both individuals and organizations, including seven Nobel laureates, the Dalai Lama, the former president of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias, La Colenza, Mairead Corrigan McGuire from Northern Ireland, Ila Gandhi, the granddaughter of the Mahatma, and a variety of people who share this understanding that the time to do this is now. I want to be part of this, Lech Valenza. There is an important need to pursue this ideal, the Dalai Lama. The Nonviolent Peace Force. The rest of that is a fundraising pitch which we're not making today, although if you have connections to anyone with wealth, um, you feel free to talk to me at the end. Um, but so I wanted to talk about unarmed civilian peacekeeping with a focus on my NGO, my nonprofit, Nonviolent Peace Force, and specifically the work we did in Sri Lanka. So, what is unarmed civilian peacekeeping? It's civilians who go without weapons who provide direct protection to civilians under threat of physical violence. Um, there have been projects all around the world. Um, Sri Lanka, Guatemala, El Salvador, Colombia, uh, Mindanao in the Philippines, South Sudan, um, Mexico, uh, the United States, um, just many, many different places that different unarmed civilian peacekeeping operations have worked. We try to support local civil society, the nonviolent movements that exist everywhere, everywhere, to help them to uh, strengthen their capacity to protect themselves and to prevent further outbreaks of violence. And we also try to work to strengthen the existing mechanisms that are, are there to address violence, escalation, like police force, like civil society. The teams are multinational, um, both women and men, with specific training on how to respond to violence with nonviolence. Um, we had a, there was a, uh, one of the guys you heard in the film from Kenya, Olo, was driving our truck and a group of angry young Singhalese, and Singhalese are primarily Buddhist men, who surrounded the truck and started to smash the windows and were very threatening, had a hand grenade, and many of us would have panicked and tried to hit the accelerator and just get out of there before we got hurt. And Olo from Kenya um, had the kind of training and the kind of character that was able to de-escalate the situation um, and um, sort of talk his way out of that, that scary, scary moment that could have resulted in either one of the young men being killed or one of our team being killed. And the other piece that was amazing about that story was we had on our staff a Muslim guy from Sri Lanka who knew one of these Buddhist guys who were upset and angry and arranged a meeting for the next day. And we were able to have a meeting and transform this very divisive, volatile conflict into one where the young men understood that we were not there against them. And they apologized for what they did to our truck and for scaring our staff. And so it's that kind of strength of character, that commitment to nonviolence that's really critical for our staff because you're in such difficult situations. Deeply immersed in the local community, um, they mentioned several times the power of relationships, um, a commitment to nonviolence, a commitment to not taking sides. Like you can be on the side of human rights without taking the side of one of the parties in the conflict. Um, strategic, nimble, being able to change strategies. After the tsunami in 2003, uh, 2004, we were able to, we had to shift gears because the tsunami was so devastating. Um, but also, when there's something happening, working the telephones to respond to an incident of violence um, very quickly. Relatively cost effective, by far cheaper than uh, conventional soldiers. And independent of governments. Um, or the UN or the African Union or the EU so that we don't have the political baggage that comes with such associations. 
Uh, some of the strategies are protective accompaniment. Uh, a group called Peace Brigades International um, will take a human rights lawyer whose life is threatened and have an outsider who's just with them as an unarmed bodyguard. And simply by being an outsider, that human rights lawyer, their safety, their bubble of safety just increases dramatically um, so that they can continue to do their work um, without risk of abduction or intimidation or some kind of violence being done to them. Um, occasionally interpositioning, getting in the middle uh, between conflicting sides. We don't do this very often. Um, there's a story coming up that I'll tell you about. Um, working in communities to help identify when signs are escalating, when there's a conflict that's escalating between the communities. The, um, it's very rarely spontaneous truly spontaneous. Um, when you hear about horrible atrocities that happen, there's usually lots of signs that happen. In Rwanda, that was quite, quite clear. It was not a spontaneous thing. Uh, rumor control. There's another story I'll tell in a minute about that. Um, creating safe spaces. When you have divided communities, there's often so much fear for moderates to reach out. Um, to go to the other side, to take the risk, to say, let's talk about this. And so Nonviolent Peace Force has a, a, a neutral zone. And we can do the initiation and bring the moderates together who want to transform a violent, tense situation. And sometimes we work with compliance of ceasefires, monitoring agreements. Uh, in Guatemala, that situation where a human rights defender, the woman on your right, uh, on your left, was her, two of her colleagues had been killed. Their organization was very intimidated. And the woman on the right from North Carolina went down there for three months and was just with her. Didn't do anything in particular besides be a peaceful presence with her. But the people who want to perpetrate violence do not want the international community to notice. They don't want the attention. And also, um, it has a fairly powerful impact on people willing to do violence. Uh, I was mentioned in the film that in Sri Lanka that there's a rampant use of, there was a rampant use of child soldiers, uh, which was quite disturbing uh, morally, emotionally. And the, our group was able to um, work with local Sri Lankan activists and local Sri Lankan families. There was 26 kids taken from a particular village um, one day. It was very unusual recruitment. Uh, forced recruitment strategy. And the families connected with the Sri Lankan activists who connected with Nonviolent Peace Force and with UNICEF and the activists and the families, we all went to the Tamil Tiger recruitment place and said, what are you doing? You said you aren't going to recruit child soldiers anymore and here you have these 26 kids. And, and they saved face. They said, I'm sorry we made a mistake and all the 26 kids went home the next day. Um, so that was a particularly effective case for those 26 kids. And sometimes people would be recruited and they would escape, but they couldn't go home because the rebel groups would find them and re-abduct them. And so we would often be part of what was the Sri Lanka version of the Underground Railroad, getting kids out of that area to a safe place, a vocational center, a religious place, some place where they could uh, grow up and, and not be re-abducted. Often simply a protective presence. So if somebody wants to have a nonviolent demonstration, a rally, um, and they're afraid of the army or the police response, or they're afraid of an armed group response. And so they might just ha ask us to be a presence for that demonstration, which again has a calming effect for people who are willing to do violence. One of the things we were worried about was whether this was race-based whether it was white skin that provided the protection or whether it was simply being outsiders. And in Sri Lanka, anyway, one of the things we were quite happy to learn was that um, it didn't matter. So we had uh, that Kenyan man I talked about earlier, or Soraya from Brazil, or uh, Pramila, who was born in India. Um, they all carried a similar international protective umbrella with them that was very powerful. And this. This approach doesn't work everywhere. I mean, most 
perpetrators of violence are concerned about their international reputation. But I did some research in Sierra Leone, and I don't know that the people who were doing the vicious violence in Sierra Leone would have cared whose arm they were cutting off, that they were not really uh, particularly accountable. And so you have, to, you have to do a lot of research for each conflict. But generally, most groups that are perpetrating armed violence will have a second thought if they know that internationals are present. I mentioned that very rarely do we do interpositioning. At one point, the things were escalating in, in Mindanao in the Philippines, and between the, one of the main rebel group and between the government of the Philippines. Um, and we were able to go to the middle, and we had relationships already established with leaders on both sides. So by being in the middle, that stopped the bullets. And then by working the telephone, um, the, the, the advent of cellular technology is very important to our movement. Um, we're able to talk to both sides and negotiate a ceasefire so that these thousand, the people who live there, did not have to leave. Um, in Sri Lanka, often violence would, would migrate. So there would be an incident um, in one area on the coast, and it would escalate between two groups. Um, sometimes, often, often it, it looks like it's a religious conflict in these areas. So in Sri Lanka, it often looked like a religious conflict between the Buddhists and the Hindus, or between the Muslims and the Hindus, or that kind of thing. And usually it's about power and about minority rights. But it, on the surface, it looks like it's about religion, but it's really not. So even as I tell this story where there was a Muslim Tamil conflict, a uh, Muslim Hindu, um, it's, it's not really about a religious difference. It's more of communities that are estranged and where there was some kind of violence that happened. And then the violence escalates and migrates. And so one of the things we were able to do in Sri Lanka was to set up a peace mechanism in this particular town and get community members, leaders from both sides to agree ahead of time that if there's violence again, we're going to come together, we're going to sit down, and we're going to agree not to have the violence in our community. And so just these simple mechanisms can interrupt um, the outward spread like a pebble in a pond, which is often pretty simple but very powerful. Uh, in South Sudan, the world's newest country, um, we did something pretty unusual, and that was to have a women's only peace team. And part of that was to respond to sexual violence and that women who have endured sexual violence often are not at all comfortable talking to men. And, um, and it was primarily composed of South Sudanese women. So it was local people who were being trained and empowered to support women who had suffered sexual violence and encourage them to report it, also figure out ways to mechanisms to stop, to reduce the sexual violence. And, and that's particularly exciting. I talked earlier about rumor control. So sometimes there'll be like a car accident or a house will burn down and the story will get twisted. Like somebody intentionally killed this kid because he was Muslim, because he was Buddhist, because he was something. And so then there's a, a story that gets out of control and nobody knows who to trust. And so one of the benefits of being outsiders and building relationships with all sides is that people will tend to trust us to have an accurate reporting. So here was a case where there was a, a building that burned down and we were able again to pull out the cell phones, work with the community leaders, the religious leaders, the local town leaders and say this was not arson, this was a fire that happened, it was benign, it's just end of story, and do what you can to stop your communities from escalating. And it worked. Uh, in the Philippines, something new happened for us was that we got invited to be an official part of the ceasefire monitoring mechanism. Um, that was particularly exciting. In Sri Lanka, we were not really part of any high-level governmental agreements. But in the Philippines, we were able to get enough respect and credibility to be invited to be part of the ceasefiring uh, agreement mechanism. And I think one of my volunteers. 
there had been no conflict since September. Usually the conflicts are in the dry season between September and April. This has been a 100% success. I give the credit to Nonviolent Peace Force. Sapan Abuyi, Deputy Governor of Western Equatoria State in South Sudan. So it's, it's, it's not that um, complicated what we do. It's really not rocket science. It's just having a little bit of courage, a little bit of training, a little bit of networking, a little bit of support from the glo wider global community, and to be able to have a dramatic impact on a place like rural South Sudan. <coughs> so why does it work? You know, taking the time to listen to a police commander, to a religious leader, to a town leader, to a women's group, um, to, that, to those kids who were surrounded the truck and smashed all the windows. Taking the time to listen and understand and empathize often is transformative in building trust and then helping communities to build trust together. One time there was a, a Hindu-Christian conflict that churches were burnt, uh, funerals had gotten uh, hand grenades and people had been killed in this relatively small village and, and it was right on the area between the government controlled area and the rebel controlled area and so there was no existing structural mechanism to, to address that, no police that were there because it was right on the, right on the line and what, what we, we got called by, again by a local activist who heard about this and so we were able to take our vehicle, drive to this village and at least stop the fire in the moment because we don't speak the, the local language except for our, our, our local staff so there's all these limitations but we could stop the the violence from escalating and then we could talk to a moderate Christian priest who is 30 kilometers down the road and find a moderate Hindu priest somewhere else and they would say yeah we'll go help that community if you're with us because we're scared too because things are pretty hot and so finding local people who can serve in a mediation role in this small village to talk about what happened and how to resolve the conflicts without further killing was pretty powerful and pretty simple. So these stories that, that, that really moved me where, where a little bit of outside intervention changed the whole dynamic. So when we Look at this. Um, so forget about the international pressure for the second. Um, so what usually happens is you'll have decision makers in a conflict. Um, think of anywhere in the world. It could be the government, it could be a rebel group, it could be religious sectors. So they have a concern about their image, international image, usually. And then they have this chain of command down throughout their organization and then they have people who actually do the violence and the victims. So that's the normal cycle you hear about in Rwanda, in Bosnia, um, all different places. This is often how it works. And um, so then you have the international pressure. So different groups, Doctors Without Borders, um, or the Red Cross, um, journalists who are all paying attention, Amnesty International, and they can apply pressure to the decision makers. And the decision makers may decide it wasn't us. We didn't have anything to do with it. So then they can deflect outward the pressure from the international community. And um, so it wasn't really me. It wasn't us. We don't know who did that. Um, and the violence continues. So the indigenous community that's being oppressed continues to be oppressed. But then you enter an outside organization that's, that's got a mission to respond to conflict. Like you could have an outside organization that's doing um, uh, literacy, but their mission is not to, to deal with conflict directly. And they're often very wisely concerned about their own safety, so when conflicts escalates, they withdraw to protect their staff, understandably. But if you have an international organization that's concerned about um, 
what's happening to the civilians. So what we can do is inform the international community what's going on, but also intervene at all levels, because we're on the ground in the communities, and we are able to both influence the decision makers, but also influence the people who are actually perpetrating the violence. Um, often we'll get a call that something's happening somewhere, and the first thing we do is just go right there and see what's happening. And so this is the, the power of unarmed civilian peacekeeping. And sometimes people would say, like we had people who used to be soldiers who served on our staff, and they felt safer without weapons. That if you're fighting you and you've all got weapons, and somebody shows up on the outside without a weapon, it's not a threat. Whereas if I show up with a big weapon, all of a sudden I'm a potential player in this violence escalation. Whoops. Um, so what's amazing is, is we, we had uh, somebody who served in Vietnam. We had somebody who served in the Indian Army um, who felt safer without weapons um, to do this work. And, um, and that, to me, says a lot people who've been trained in traditional uh, military style training who who feel safer personally without carrying their own weapons. So as was mentioned in the, f the film, we only go where we're invited. Um, we continue to practice nonviolence within our teams and in our work. Um, and, and it's really, again, finding, building the space to bring civil society together, um, protect human rights, and protect people from further violence. Our modeling of nonviolence has a strong impact, especially in groups that are divided across religious lines. And then they'll see our team that has members from, um, uh, from Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Buddhists. It, it tends to be a model for how you can get along beyond the divides that often people get stuck and paralyzed in. So there are many groups that are doing this work. Um, one of the oldest is Peace Brigades International. Um, if any of you are drawn to do this work, Peace Brigade PBI is a good place to start. For people who are uh, Christian and have a, a strong faith-based sense, there's a group called Christian Peacemaker Teams, Nonviolent Peace Force that I've been talking about, there's the Fellowship of Reconciliation, Witness for Peace. There's many groups that are doing different aspects of this kind of work. And I, if you're at all drawn to this, there's several flyers for different groups down here. But I do encourage you to find out more. Um, this relatively new doctrine that uh, challenges some of the old ideas of absolute sovereignty that's really important to know about. Somebody had, yeah. Thanks. Just the first two. R2P was established, R2P established in 2005 by the United Nations. It's based on, based on the idea that sovereignty is not a right, but a responsibility. So far, the main intervention concept for intervention of last resort is a military one. Thank you. And so R2P is, is great. It really came out of the global embarrassment that's Rwanda. Um, that the international community failed the Rwandans in our unwillingness to intervene. Um, there were many stages where small intervention could have changed the course of events in Rwanda dramatically. But the thing that R2P doesn't embrace yet that I think would be an improvement is unarmed civilian peacekeeping as a strategy. That um, it's not just sending in soldiers when things have all gone bad. But um, to bring in the idea of unarmed civilian peacekeeping as a method in Rwanda, in Syria, um, other places. Um, Ban Ki-moon on the responsibility to protect uh, 2012. Human protection is a defining purpose of the United Nations in the 21st century. Civil society can be critical to avoiding an escalation of violence in Syria and South Sudan. We need to give such groups the support. We need to give such groups our support and encouragement. Thank you. 
So we're, this movement is gaining credibility. Um, there's many people in the UN who are seeing the cost effectiveness the moral high ground of using nonviolence rather than the UN imposing something. Um, and it's really exciting. So, but we need, we have a long way to go. And, um, and R2P is a really good turning point and we need to carry it further. So some of the ideas people say, well, what, what can I do? And what can we do, you know, in New Hampshire, in the United States? Um, so one idea is to volunteer with these organizations if you have particular skills um, to help spread the word. Um, you know, like when I mentioned I had worked in domestic violence and there's just always, if we just get creative, there's different ways to respond. And, um, and one of the ideas that I had was if, to the men was if you're ever freaking out and feeling like you're about to use violence, go to the nearest emergency room. Just get yourself out of there and do something different from what you normally do. And, um, and so it's kind of like this, like one time there was two groups of civilians who were about to get violent with each other and it was the Indonesian army who was monitoring and trying to figure out how to stop this violence and they got some loudspeakers, they put their weapons off to the side and there was some national song that crossed the boundaries. And so the soldiers are dancing in front of these two groups that want to kill each other. And it totally transformed the situation. So somebody took a really creative idea to an escalating situation. So rather than just trying to impose their will on these groups, they were able to transform the energy into to, uh, a peaceful way for them to back down and figure out how they could sort out whatever it was that was bothering them. I mentioned earlier one way things we need is to help um, with fundraising. Um, the budget of the Nonviolent Peace Force is about six million dollars a year. About half of that comes from individuals and small foundations in the United States and the other half comes from various governmental agencies and the UN. Um, primarily European governments, um, UNICEF, uh, UNHCR, some money from Japan, Australia, um, different places around the world. But that's where we're doing it. And the money from um, the United States, the most benefit, the, the, the reason why that's a particularly valuable is that it uh, allows us to do research that um, institutional donors usually give money for a particular project, but not for exploration. So money's always, always, it's always um, needed. Um, building local peace teams. Um, there have been times in the U.S. where there were like a very volatile, uh, what comes to mind is uh, there was a Ku Klux Klan rally and people were really, the anti-Klan people were really angry and, and it, the police were worried about it and they just didn't want to have to use force and there was a group that came up, um, Michigan Peace Teams they were called, and they provided peacekeepers to be in between the Klan and the counter protesters. And so when there's situations where there's escalating violence in, in our community for whatever reason, um, providing peace teams, peace, peace teams can soften the impact of violence. Um, to consider becoming an unarmed peacekeeper yourself and also to spread the idea of different form of response. You know, how do we respond to 9-11? How do we respond to what's going on in Syria? How do we respond to what's going on in Bosnia, Rwanda? Like to build the momentum that there's other options. I mentioned the, the program I work with in Brattleboro, the School for International Training, World Learning. So those of you who have your bachelors already or after you do to consider coming, there's a summer institute. It brings together 60 peace builders from about 35 countries for three weeks over the summer in June. A very powerful program um, around people often on both sides of an issue. So you might have Palestinians and Israelis or you might have um, uh, Sri Lankans from both sides. And, um, and just to be in that environment together studying conflict transformation and while also working within a global community. 
So to consider that, and I mentioned there's flyers down there. And, um, and then I wanted to leave a bunch of time to have some conversation. So um, I'll slip there and shift to questions. I lived in Sri Lanka from 2003 to 2006, and then I went back every year for the next four years for one to two months. And um, I was mostly based in the capital city, Colombo, and so I didn't, I wasn't in the field where the most of the violence was happening. Um, but our teams were in the field, and and there were many situations where we worked with child soldiers who were abducted. Um, and I was part of one of the. Uh, the Underground Railroad trips that I talked about where there was a young woman who had been captured, had been trained as a fighter, had been with the Tigers, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam um, for several months, escaped, went back home, but was totally not safe back at her home because they know exactly where she lives. And, um, and through various networks, she got in touch with us, her family got in touch with us, and we connected her. We, transported her through several military checkpoints um, to a safe place in a different part of the country um, at a, a, it was a religious school. Um, was it just her or her and their family? Just her. Okay. Um, but lots, but that was one example of many, I mean the, the thing with the child soldiers is it's often usually one kid at a time, which is incredibly gratifying, but when you're looking at a national conflict, it's it's a, it's a it's a small impact on a big such a big problem. So except for that example where I talked about where there was 26 kids that were released all together, it was often one at a time. But the 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 leadership of the Tigers knew that we were working on this, and we'd like to think, although it's very hard to evaluate, that we were having an impact on their overall uh, recruitment strategy. So that's harder to to prove to demonstrate, but. And that was incredibly important work. And one of the ways, one, the other problem that the, the, the girls who were taken, um, long hair is pretty traditional in rural Tamil society. And the first thing the tigers do would be to cut the girl's hair. So as soon as she escaped, everybody knew who she was. And so part of the problem was we had to go someplace else and wait for the years it took to grow her hair back. Um, so it was especially hard for girls who were had escaped because it was so clear that they were former soldiers. Yeah. So do those children ever get returned back to their families like later on, or do they never? Escape? Yes, they do. Well, especially now the war's over. Okay. So now, now all the kids who went and got to be in safe place. Ah, oh, sorry. So I'm supposed to repeat the question. Um, so the question was, do the kids ever get to go home? And they do. Um, so, especially now that the war is over, it's safe to go home. Um, when the war was still going on, it probably wasn't safe to go home. So during that several years, however long that took, um, a very occasionally somebody would be high profile enough that we'd need to help them get out of the country. Um, but mostly the child soldiers could stay in the country somewhere else safe. You guys generally have an optimistic like, approach to like, human behavior. So you guys tend to favor more of like, a nurture approach. But how do you deal with people who just generally need your violence? Or... So let me see if I get the question. It's, it's um, how do, do we have an optimistic approach that, that people can change, basically? Um, and what do we do with people who maybe are just only violence is the only way? Um, I suppose that's where, where uh, some of the Gandhian roots come in, like, or, or the Martin Luther King, like, you can hate the behavior, but don't hate the individual. And most people, most people don't want to kill. It's hard to train somebody to kill. That that is not easy to do. And it takes a tremendous effort of, 
um, psychological training to get people where they're willing to do that. Um, and so untraining that isn't as hard. Um, and most people, I think, prefer a nonviolent way of life. I mean, nonviolence is as, as old as humanity, and it's by far the primary way we interact. Um, so uh, we do believe that people can change and transform and that they really, given the appropriate context, would not choose to be violent. I mean, obviously there are exceptions and you have to deal with them, but, but yeah, I'd say we're pretty optimistic. On um, the way back. Like, you saying people don't want to change, but it's like, it feels like it's hard for me to, like, even talk to anybody about any of this stuff. They're pretty so comfortable here. It's not that people are okay with the violence, but they're okay because we're so detached from it. I was in the Marine Corps and from 04 to 08, and uh, like, nobody realizes what's going on in the peripheries of our empire. And, uh, like, nobody cares. You got immediate gratification, you're fed, you know, you're fat and happy. So who cares? Like, you can't even, like, how do you get people to, uh, do anything. Like, you, can, you can tell people horrible stories all day long and you go, well, you know, what's the big deal? Right. Why are you making such a big stink about this? Because right. they don't, you know, look so around. It's right. a great place, you know, great place to live. So the, the question then is, is how, do you, how do we get people to care? Yeah, they don't care. Um, especially in the United States, where people tend to be comfortable and insulated from the violence that's happening. And, and that's a tough question. That's really hard. Um, and it is pretty comfortable here for most of us. Um, and we can ignore the fact that a huge percentage of young African American men are in prison. Um, we can ignore the fact that the things that we might be doing that are pretty horrific in Iraq. It almost feels like it's by design. They didn't tax us for the war, so why would we care? And all those guys volunteered, so who cares about them either? Yep, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> um, it certainly came home in Vietnam. There was certainly a sort of a national. Uh, awakening of some sorts that changed society and and now it's hard because it's more sanitized there's you know now we use drones to do our dirty work and even the people operate the drones are somewhat detached from what happens so it's almost you know the thing that scares me is almost like a video game yeah. and and this whole thing about extrajudicial killing it's it's illegal to do this and we're doing it and it scares me and and um, that's a tough problem um, so, from your stores and stuff, it seems like you're pretty effective on the ground at um, you know, arranging some sort of peace or getting people to not act violently. Um, how do you, like, are you effective enough that the brokering deals or getting to the root cause that there's a way to sustain that security after your team moves, or is it just kind of like a continual process? So. The question I'm hearing is, is how do we sustain this change? Right. Um, and that's hard. So one of the things we've learned in Sri Lanka that we didn't learn until five years into the program was really reinforcing local capacity. So training local civil society on um, uh, protection. How to protect your village, how to protect your community, what are things you can do, um, and, and building structures. So we talked about that time where the violence usually would migrate. So helping to build a structure where the business leaders who get affected by the violence first um, would come together and form a peace committee and, and build those relationships so that before the violence came to their community, they could meet and say, we stand in solidarity with each other across whatever divide is across, and we don't want the violence to come to our community. So those kind of structures sometimes last, sometimes don't last. But, um, but then if you, the question, if you make that broader on a national level, then it's harder. So like the Philippines was a great example that we got involved at the very high level for the ceasefire, the ceasefire monitoring. Um, and so it's like you have an impact with this child soldier or this particular village or this human rights defender, but how do you have an impact uh, on a larger scale? And I think we're still getting better at that, but still much to learn. Great. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, along those lines, I'm wondering, well, a, how do you assess your impact, and, and like what part of the, let's say, the war being over in Sri Lanka, for instance, you know, is supposed to be a part of? It. No. How do you know when it's time to leave? I mean, like, is the war over? Leave, or are you 
Right. So the question is, is how to assess impact, how to know when to leave, um, how to know what contribution we've made um, in a lasting way. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so there's different ways that we're learning how to do proper monitoring and evaluation, how to capture the stories, both qualitative and quantitative. And it's sort of an ongoing challenge because it's, it's hard to measure, you know, did, did we really prevent this person from being killed? Because they're still alive. But we don't know they would have been killed if we hadn't been there um, or if this village hasn't been burnt. So it's, um, it's a challenge to figure out how to do the kind of monitoring and evaluation that is credible because that's what the donors want to see. What's your impact and how do you know what you're doing? Um, but you can, there are ways to do that around taking an area where we worked and an area where we didn't work and seeing how the conflict moved and how it impacted the society. And around leaving, uh, Sri Lanka we left because the government no longer wanted us there. And we did not affect the end of the war. That was a military victory for the government. And, um, and in their final stages of the war, there was tremendous civilian casualties. Um, and it's now at the Human Rights Council in Geneva around sanctions um, on Sri Lanka for what they did to end the war. And ending the war was good. Ending that violence and the fear in that society was good. But the way it happened was, was pretty harsh. So um, with every conflict, we try to build in an exit strategy. Um, when do we leave? How do we know when we leave? Uh, how do we know when we've been successful? And, uh, but sometimes uh, the government can say, we don't want you here anymore, and we have to go. So that's particularly painful, because for many of the groups we worked with in Sri Lanka, there was then a vacuum after we left that was really hard for anybody else to meet that vacuum. Yeah? Um, do you mostly get the word out about this group um, through being like this? Like, how do you get numbers to the point? So how do we? Publicized, basically. Yeah. Um, it's through. It, well, there's so many peace groups now, which is great, and there's more peace education programs, which is great. Um, so there's there's been a proliferation of different uh, peace education, different kind of global peace groups. So really conveying that through all the channels we know to tell the story, um, trying to get what larger media we can because one of the ideas would be to, to mainstream this movement, to not make it be particularly progressive or particularly peacenicky, but to make it be um, tactically smart. So you don't even have to be particularly um, dovish to go, this could be a good idea. Um, so it's finding what exposure we can in, in national, international media. Um, one thing that was really nice, is a very small program in the South Caucasus. Um, and we were approached by the president who had heard about our work and, and wanted us to be a part of that. So sometimes it can be high level, sometimes it could be grassroots, um, but we need to keep telling the story and, and spreading this book. Yeah, I mean, that, a, short, a short background on that. The British were very good at dividing groups. And so the British gave the minority group, Tamils, primarily Hindu, some elevated status, better education, better jobs, compared to the majority group. And so when the British left in 1948, the majority group, who had been marginalized or uh, somehow oppressed, were understandably angry. Um, and so it was our turn. Um, this was true in Rwanda as well. And so then there was the pendulum swung the other way. And so it was less about a conflict between Hinduism and Buddhism. It was more a conflict around majority, mi minority, and respect, and, and people feeling like they have dignity and identity. Um, like one of the things that the Buddhists did early on was to say, our language is the only language in Sri Lanka. And so if you spoke Tamil, and you had a job, and you didn't learn Singalese in the next two years, you were out of a job. And those kind of things were just this, this trend. So it looks like it's a religious conflict, but it's really not. Um, 
And that's often the case. Same, same with Rwanda, same in other places. So uh, I've been to a number of lectures and about peace building stuff, and, it's, and they, basically all of them are talking about how East Americans are like, oh, we're going to go in peace and all that stuff. I do believe they can be. Like, I, I see the good thing in that. But we do not understand all the like thousands of years these countries have been like, fighting. We're talking about the Middle East more specifically. And it has been ingrained in their culture to not like neighbors around them. How are we, a country that is basically not even close to them, not just that they do, to pretend to understand them? Right. So the thing that I, the, I teach this course, uh, it's a year-long postgraduate certificate online course in peace building. And we have students from all over the world, which is really cool. Um, so we come together for three weeks in Vermont in June, and then we come together in January for a week in, Je in Rwanda. And, and the rest is online. But the thing that people really are getting over and over again is, boy, I need to know more about this conflict before I can attempt to respond. And, um, and so it's like the, the iceberg. Like what you see is so small and all the old dynamics are so big. And so understanding all the dynamics that are hidden becomes critical. And so whether that's in Sri Lanka or the Philippines or wherever. And so people from the outside need to really grasp that. And the, the other piece we learned that relates to your question is the power, like in Sri Lanka, we primarily for the first few years had mostly internationals and a small number of Sri Lankans. But by the time we left, it was half and half. And in South Sudan, there's a majority of South Sudanese who are on the staff. And so really building the capacity of people who are there, who have the history, um, and who have the knowledge, who don't, uh, don't need the same kind of years and months of orientation to, to be able to have that impact. So. Um, I, I think I'm grasping the, the question is, is perpetually learning the conflict at a deeper level and also really building in as much local capacity as we can. And the other thing that's true though is that the locals often have the similar fear. So like when I mentioned that story about the moderate priest and uh, the Hindu and Christian priest, they were willing to mediate that but they were afraid for their own lives. So the internationals provide some of that, that cushion of safety, um, whether it's in South Sudan or Sri Lanka, um, to, to support the local people to find some clever way to mediate the situation. So I hope that answers. Um, so you mentioned that you only go places on invitation. So um, can you explain that the invitations are indicators that besides at least some so the criteria for intervention for going somewhere, um, so one is that there's some group inviting. It may not be the governments, it may not be the high leaders, it may not be a large group. It may not necessarily even be both sides, although hopefully we do that. It could be civil society, a particular nonprofit NGO saying, please come help us. And um, so, so, that, so one is the invitation. Uh, one is fundability. Um, or we would be able to pay for this project. One thing that makes Nonviolent Peace Force different from some of the other unarmed civilian peacekeeping organizations is we pay our staff. Not a great salary, but enough. And most of the other ones are volunteer. Um, and it's not everybody in the world who can afford to volunteer two years of their life to go off um, and work in a conflict zone. So it's local invitation, some kind of measurement of impact. Do we think we can make a difference? Uh, fundability and, and, and a security analysis. So then that relates to impact too. Um, like some people say, has anybody ever died? There was a group from Christian, a man from Christian peacemaker teams who died in Iraq. Um, who was part of a, three of them were abducted by an armed group who wanted money and in the rescue attempt one of them was killed. So it is a risky thing, but we do intensive security analysis. Um, frankly, I'm more concerned about car accidents than I am about people getting killed by guns, but, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, 
it, the, we, we, the, the safety level, the risk analysis is pretty strong and for the most part it's pretty safe what we've been doing um, because of the international support uh, and structure that we have. But um, so it's kind of like being a soldier, but in a different way. So do you have lots of invitations to places that you decide where you'd like to go? Or how does that work? There's lots of what I might call superficial invitations. And when it gets developed into a full-scale proposal, that's less frequent. Um, so there are many conflicts where people would say, please come, but for various reasons, resources, capacity, money, we just, we don't have that. So let's see, we're going to take two more questions. Oh, there's three of you. Four of you. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't think we'll have time. Let's take um, one and then two, and then we'll see if we have time for you two guys. So basically, where's our headquarters? Yeah. Um, so, so where is Nonviolent Peace Force located? Our international headquarters is in Brussels, in, in Belgium. And that's primarily because access to European funding. And our US headquarters is in the Twin Cities, in Minneapolis, um, which is where the co-founder is from. And then some people work uh, remotely. And the rest are actual in projects, South Sudan, Philippines, etc. That there are some uh, conflicts where the decision makers don't really care about the international um, opinion. Uh, what's your guys' approach on those conflicts? What do you say out of that compared to more governmental institutions? Um, so, what's our approach to where the governments may not want us? Like they, they, don't, they don't care what the international opinion is. Right. So if you guys were there, may basically not making a difference. Yeah, I mean, uh, an interesting example of that is a group called International Solidarity Movement that did work in Palestine and Israel. And, um, and there was a, a, a several years where I think the, there were several internationals who were killed by the Israeli Defense Forces. And so I think that the, the safety that the internationals brought to that conflict wasn't, wasn't as strong, that the governments were more willing to risk hurting internationals and the consequences of international uh, pressure, reputation, whatever. Um, so, and I mentioned that in Sierra Leone, I don't, I don't think it could have worked. I don't know how it would have worked. Um, and I'm not too familiar with some of the research that's happened in Syria, but what, what the woman from Guatemala mentioned in the video was that so often we don't hear about the nonviolent movements that are happening. And, and the colleague who went to Syria, um, there's a, there's a strong civil society in Syria that's working for peace. And what we can do is to often strengthen the existing capacity that's struggling to survive. Um, so um, we may not be able to come in and do any particular magic in terms of transforming the conflict, except to be support underneath the nonviolent people who are really trying hard to figure out solutions locally. And so that's that's pretty exciting. So, hey, the, last question. Have you had the government denying you access of entry to the country? Yes. Have we ever had governments deny access of entry? Um, so uh, the way we were basically uninvited to Sri Lanka was our country director had her visa terminated with two weeks' notice. Um, so, and. And what happened was, anytime they didn't want they didn't want internationals who were doing human rights work, that they really said we're doing our own human rights work now. Um, there was a change in government and various other things, and so our human the woman who was a human rights uh, who was a human rights monitoring was her title. She was from Uganda. Um, her visa was canceled, and the country director from Canada, her visa was canceled, and so. And for the next six months, we tried to figure out what was going on and was there a way we could stay, but whether we'd hire somebody new, whether we'd get their visa approved or not was, who knows. Um, so. When you travel, do you travel individually or uh, or like visa In country, we try to have people always be at least in groups of two. Um, so when traveling internationally, that wouldn't matter as much, but within a conflict area, 
trying to make sure people are always in some, some kind of team. Well, I wanted to, uh, of course, thank Jen and to let you all know again that there's more information here on the Graduate Institute and on the Nonviolent Peace Force. And uh, I think we'll be around, Jen will be around here in the front if you have time, if you have any more questions, that we'll be able to